Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we are happy to have you back with us as we answer your gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures get sent to byf at unl.edu for a future show. Please tell us as much as you can about your question, including where you live. And don't forget to stop uh, by our social media pa pages on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. With that out of the way, Jonathan, you have My pets. living in the day. <laughs> <laughs> These are some tobacco hornworm caterpillars across various life stages. So we have the actual caterpillar stage here. And it's this kind of off color because I feed them this diet that's over here. It's kind of brown. It doesn't have chlorophyll like a real leaf. So they turn this kind of tealish turquoise color. Eventually he will pupate. The pupa is what you would find buried down in the soil and then emerge right around now as this adult moth over here, which has six orange dots along the edge of her abdomen and then kind of a brown wing structure. Sometimes people call them a hummingbird moth because they move kind of like a hummingbird and they're shaped sort of like a hummingbird or a hawk. Um, that's how they get their group name as the hawk moths. They do eat tomato plants. This one is called the tobacco hornworm, but it will love on any solanaceous plant. So eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, all those different ones out there. So if you don't want that guy. <laughs> Send it to me. I can put it in my colony. I have a farm of these in my office that I keep. I've got about 60 going right now. You can hand pick them off. You can wait for wasps to get them. Uh, you can also use things like BT when they're smaller or maybe a little spinosad when they get older. All right, excellent. Quite a beautiful color. I there. agree. They're so great and cute. Matt doesn't like caterpillar shit. <laughs> well. Yeah, we're going to eat it later. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're going to put it in between grass leaves or weed Yeah, leaves. he so won't bother we... my weeds, though. No, That's no. the problem. No what do we control. have, Matt? All right, well, we have a plethora of different weed species. Uh, this time of year, we have a lot of annual grasses emerging, and it's difficult to tell what's what when they're little. Um, the good thing is uh, most of the products that you're using to control crabgrass will control foxtail. Uh, so if it's one or the other and you don't know, uh, products with quinclorac in it do a pretty good job. Um, so I have here large crabgrass, which we're seeing actually start to tiller already. So there's, it's in the one to two leaf stage all the way up to tiller. And it's gonna go really fast with this heat and moisture that we have. And one way to tell these is there's, there's fine fuzzy like um, hair-like structures on the top and bottom of large crabgrass and that's kind of the telltale sign. There's actually hairs on the shaft of the plant too. Um, and if you have, let's say, foxtail for instance, the one in my hand that's huge is green foxtail and it has no hairs on it whatsoever. And then the one that I couldn't find as big of is yellow foxtail and it has these really long pubescent hairs just on top of the leaf. Uh, so that's a telltale sign to tell the two apart. Uh, and then goosegrass is a pretty flat, prostrate growing plant, and it's, it doesn't have any hairs on it, and it's also got just basically parallel venation. You can see pretty distinct. It almost looks like a, a ryegrass or a fescue, but it's, it's not. It's a weed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Matt, for all the loveliness. And Amy. Uh -huh. Matt. I brought more loveliness. I know, I know. So I actually looked at today, um, a client walked in my office today and brought my sample, so it made life easier <laughs> for me. So she has some sugar maples that are starting to get some brown and discoloration. She saw some leaves coming down. But when we look at the leaves, we got a couple different diseases going on. This smaller leaf here, we're gonna start seeing some browning there. We're seeing a lot of anthracnose and maple, sycamore, um, and those different tree species. That fungus typically colonizes more along the veins because that's where we have more water uh, accumulating. And so we're gonna get browning of the leaves. We may get some premature defoliation. The one that she was more concerned about is actually these leaves here that are completely black. And these are falling off. And if you take a look at the petioles themselves, we all got, also got some discoloration on that. This is maple leaf blister. It's another fungal disease. 
This one we don't always see. This one's unique because it needs 12 and a half hours of leaf wetness. Now, for my neck of the woods, 12 and a half hours of leaf wetness has been every day since <laughs> it warmed up back in March uh, with all the continuous rain. So we're seeing some major impacts of this disease on maples this year. It's one of those we're not gonna treat because right now it's too far gone. And typically if it's an older uh, established tree, we're not gonna lose that many leaves. The trees that we get concerned about is our new plantings. And you just wanna make sure you're not losing too many leaves and that you provide ample water and don't stress them out this summer and this fall. Once it stops. Raining. Once it stops raining. It may stop raining eventually. Probably today <laughs> and it'll be a hundred yeah all right kelly well i have a plant that actually likes all the rain that we've been having this is solomon seal and solomon seal is a great plant for shade so if you're looking for something on an alternative to say hostas um, it's a beautiful kind of a graceful arching plant that's how it grows that nice little arch kind of forms a colony of those arching plants um, this one is a variegated one, variegatum. So it likes heavy shade, part shade. So when you have that variegated white in there, it adds a little bit of color to, brings a little bit of light to a shady area. It does bloom in May. Um, they're not real showy. I don't know if you can see these little stems down here. Those were the flowers. They're white. Um, they're very cute, but they're just not real showy. And that is followed by a green berry that will turn black. I know everything is so fruitful this year, but I have no berries. I don't know why on my Solomon seal. Um, but I do want to warn you that that don't eat it. It will cause stomach upset. So this is a great plant for a shady area, but maybe not a landscape where you have uh, children that might eat the berries. Or you teach them, don't teach put them that in your mouth to. unless Yeah, you it's ask. not highly poisonous, but we will cause stomach upset. All right, thanks, Kelly. All right, Jonathan, you have like 65,000 pictures. Cool. So we're gonna go right through these. The first one would come from Holt County. <laughs> and this would be uh, these almost cute things, fuzzy <laughs> caterpillars, surprising amount of damage on onion plants in particular. What is this and what do we do about it? I did some digging around and I'm pretty sure that this is a, a uh, salt marsh caterpillar. They do feed on onions and they're closely related to the woolly bears that are a little more famous than these ones. It does turn into a really beautiful orange and black and white moth, but as a larva, it will eat on things like onions. So a spinosad application would be good for this. You can also use BT when they're this small, but they have those little tufts of hair on there. That's one indicator of this one. All right, and your second one is what she was calling a green white looper caterpillar on dill within two or three days the patch was nearly destroyed this is in Blair okay I have a lot of questions about this one I would want to hear more from this viewer because it is in fact a green and white looper it might be a cabbage looper it might be a celery looper they just kind of look similar in my opinion but neither of those are supposed to eat dill and I've never heard of a looper that eats dill have any of you mm -hmm. so it's a little hard for me to know if this is what caused all that damage there are other caterpillars like swallowtails that will feed on dill dill very profusely. So that might have been what caused damage. You may have caught the wrong culprit here. But if you send me some more pictures or some more emails or show me the damage, I'd be happy to try and figure that one out with you. All right. And your third one, what is it and will it eat her tomatoes? So this is a relative of the one that I brought with me tonight. This is a lined sphinx moth and it will not eat your tomatoes. It's not the one that does that. It feeds on other plants. So this one is just a pretty moth. It's a good pollinator and you don't have to worry about its larva. No. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, this is a Ralston viewer, Matt, and we had this question, I think, last year. Yes. In fact, you got this question, but it was not perhaps from this person. No. It, this it one was. proliferates <laughs> in the lawn, uh, and it grows in patches, and it gets tall, and what is it? How can he get rid of it, and what works as a pre-emerge? He says roguing it out is futile. Oh, yeah, and it's just going to keep coming. Um, <laughs> it's actually... Um, a really good picture and that's what makes it easier to identify because there's a couple other weeds that look like it. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania pellitory is the weed that it is but it also looks like uh, Virginia copper leaf which has serrated uh, leaves and this one doesn't it has smooth leaves so that's that's a way to tell the difference uh, but it's it's a pretty shallow rooting structure and they do pull out easy and they generally form in clusters uh, so if you don't weed them out and you let them seed out they're probably gonna be there next year. Uh, I've also read maybe mulching later in the spring and it's going to bury those seeds instead of earlier in the spring and then it, it doesn't warm up as fast so they don't germinate. Uh, it's part of the nettle family but 
it is not a problem. There's nothing to worry about it. It's it won't harm you. Okay. But it does. It's pretty persistent, and it yeah. just grows like crazy. It likes the shaded, moist areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know this. Yes, so just keep pulling them. Yes, we know this. You could actually price, uh, get a string trimmer in there and just knock them off. I don't you think could. they'll grow back. I'll bring some in so for you. So that would be easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, you have, uh, this is an Alliance viewer. Mm -hmm. Cedar is severely infected with cedar apple rust, and you can see the, uh, the galls on there. And the co-host was cut down. They think it was the only susceptible apple, but he wonders how long the galls will remain. Should he be treating? Will the trees survive? So the galls on the cedar will actually remain there forever. Um, they don't really fall off too much. They don't necessarily produce spores every single year. Uh, they produce spores for a few years and then they die out. So the big trick behind cedar apple rust is the spores can travel over five miles. So even though you don't have the apple there, um, it, they can go a long ways. If you want to plant an apple back in the area, go ahead and do it. I would highly suggest a resistant variety of apple uh, to be able to handle that inoculum flow that you have in there. But overall in your cedar, it shouldn't make a lot of difference. All right, and your next one is actually in Plymouth. And this is what he was seeing on the back of his ornamental tree. Ornamental tree. Yeah. This is uh, one of the cedar rusts, most likely it's leaning toward that cedar hawthorn rust. We had a long sporulation period this spring because of the wet, uh, cool conditions. So we are seeing a lot of sporulation and the spores it's producing right now is actually going back to the cedar trees. So there's nothing you're gonna be able to do for that ornamental tree at this point in time. Next year, as we start looking at weather patterns, if we're gonna be cool and wet for a long extended period of time, a contact fungicide spray to help protect that tree may be beneficial, especially if it's a newer tree. All right, thanks, Amy. You get this one, okay. Kelly. Whether it belongs with you or not remains to be seen, but this is a viewer who has, uh, they're near Hastings. Mm -hmm. Cucumbers, they were doing great. All of a sudden they started to yellow. The leaves started to turn brown right after the neighboring cornfield was sprayed with a strong south wind. Wondered if it was chemical damage or is it a coincidence? I, I suspect this might be, it looks like a very young plant, so I suspect it might maybe be more an issue, a root issue, that it's an underestablished root system that's not supporting fairly large leaves. And if you look closely, the new growth is fairly vigorous already. And part of the reason, I, this is, again, my educated guess, but part of the reason I think that is you've got the scorching or the browning on the edge of the leaf, which is an indication that the uh, leaves are losing moisture faster than the roots may be replacing it. So that would be an indication of an underdeveloped root system. On um, the yellowing, I'm not real sure about mm, on that one, maybe nutritional, but the yellowing has me confused a little bit, unless Amy has some insight there. But I, that's, that would be my, what I suspect. So what you might want to do is mulch it um, I noticed the soil looked pretty hard and it was bare. So maybe put on about a one to two inch layer of wood chips to, or a one inch layer of dried grass clippings around it and see if that'll help that root system to establish a little bit better. All right, thanks Kelly. Well, you know, grafted plants can offer us some better disease control or resistance, as Amy said, as well as some very interesting shapes in the case of those plants on standard. But there are some problems that come along as the plant matures or can come along. And so for our first feature tonight, I'm going to show you a few of these issues and talk about what you can do about it. Plants are grafted in the landscape world for a number of different reasons, starting oftentimes with hardiness. So people who grow roses know that if you can get a rose on its own root, the chances are it is really going to survive the climate. However, if the top is not hardy and the root is, it may die back to the ground. One of the things that's happened in the plant world is that consumers love plants that are grown on standard. So it's either a low standard or a high standard, which essentially is a trunk. Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of plants that are grafted on standard is that they revert. So classic is this is probably a Diablo nine bark, one of the big shrub nine barks. You can see where the standard was and you can see that we have no plant left on the top of this. Instead, we have all of these suckers from the base. So one of the problems with grafted plants is depending on the top hardiness, depending on the vigor of the rootstock, you will not end up with the plant you want, you'll end up with having to deal with the suckers. 
People really like hydrangeas grafted on standards, sort of as one of those great big meatballs by the front door or even in a container. But again, you can see what happens when either we have a lot of damage or we have graft incompatibility. In this instance, here is the vigor of all the sprouts that are coming from the base below the graft union. And here is what the plant is trying to do on the top. Realistically, what should happen here is give up on the standard, cut the big twig out of here, and let this turn back into a shrub. A really troubling problem has started with our ornamental pears, which were considered invasive now. And you can see what has happened here. The rootstock itself has started to really become aggressive. The foliage doesn't match. The growth is tremendous. This is what causes these pears to become invasive species. And unfortunately, in, in taking care of all of those suckers from any plant from below the graft union, you can go ahead and cut them out, but that is a never-ending process. You can use a couple of chemicals, but that will typically take the top off and not damage the roots or not manage the roots. So they're just going to continue to sucker. Many of our new hybrid species of trees are grafted. And again, what that does is supposedly promote a lot of vigor. Perhaps it is disease resistance or insect resistance in a different form or color. You can see on this elm where the graft union is. You can also see the damage that has occurred below the point of the graft. And oftentimes what happens that causes trees to revert or go into that suckering and shrubs as well is the damage in that rootstock causes the rootstock to take over. And you can see that this is actually happening with this elm. So one of the things you can do with the plants in your landscape that are grafted is make sure that the plant is healthy to begin with when you buy it. Pay attention to whether the suckering is occurring on some plants. As an example, Harry Lauder's walking stick, if you take out the suckers from below the graft union, you can restore the vigor and the health of the top of that plant. So keep an eye on those grafted plants, prune out the suckers, don't buy those ones on standard to begin with. Not a good idea. Words of advice. Words of advice, and obviously very objective. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, let's see, this is a West La Vista viewer, Jonathan, red spots on an oak, mm -hmm. and great pictures actually on both sides of most leaves. All spheres have a hollow core, and he sent us, I think, a picture of that beautiful hollow core with, with a measuring with a scale. Stick. Wow! Scale. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, th these are definitely galls that are on oaks. Oaks have some of the most galls in the plant world. They can get all different ones on their leaves, on their branches. These ones, I'm going to guess, are either oak apple gall or they may be a midge gall. It depends on if they keep getting bigger and turning kind of translucent as the season goes on and get this fibrous mass inside of them. But no, they're not a problem. You don't have to control them. You can prune out some of the leaves now and destroy the, the leaves so that you get rid of them and they don't reproduce. And you can also rake in the fall and destroy those leaves. And hopefully you won't have to deal with it again next year. Perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, we have the dreaded identification of grass. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> the first one here is an Elkhorn viewer and actually pretty good pictures yeah. on this one. She says it's taking over spots in the yard. The turf that she does have is bluegrass uh, and she's wondering, A, what is it? If she kills it with glyphosate, when can she resod or reseed? Um, well, it looks like tall fescue, like a turf type tall fescue. Um, and if it's, taking over then it's probably more in clumps mm -hmm. and what you're gonna have to do is yeah spray them out with roundup and you can seed right back into it if it's roundup alone because there's no residual with roundup um, if if it's not clumps and just small ones like here and there you might be better off just digging them out adding some soil and the bluegrass will fill in over time just because it spreads by uh, rhizomes so it, it can fill in whereas tall fescue doesn't have the opportunity to fill in big voids because it's more of a tillering grass instead of spreading by rhizomes or stolons. All right, thank you, Matt. And your second one is actually Underwood, Iowa, thick bladed grass in clumps. What is it and how do you get rid of it? And I think this is the same exact thing. And it, and it goes to show you that if you have a thin lawn and let's say you have some tall fescue in there, uh, they will just keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger and then you get this clump. And so what you have to do is either kill it, dig it out, or try and encourage new grass to come in, which is almost impossible because that plant is very strong. It has a deep root system. 
so when you're planting tall fescue, I always encourage putting a little bit of bluegrass in there. So if you do have areas that thin out, they have the opportunity to fill in and not have those clumps take over and then you have a clumpy lawn. So. All right, excellent, thanks Matt. Okay, Amy, our first uh, early girl tomato plant question. This is Lincoln viewer. The leaves are turning brown. What can be done about it? She <coughs> sent it both a far away and I think a close up picture on this one. So if you look at the close up picture, you're starting to see those brown spots. Most likely we're running into early blight, common fungal disease, but the early blight would not explain the wilting that you're seeing with that tomato plant. That's one thing I'm really concerned about. Um, especially if you've been giving it adequate water and it isn't, it has adequate water but not too much water. Why is it still wilting? Uh, there is another disease that we can see in tomatoes called verticillium wilt, which is a, a crown rot and then moves up the stem that would cause that wilting, but it doesn't cause those brown spots. So I would kind of wait and see how it looks if it continues to wilt. Uh, I don't, I don't believe there's good diagnosis or prognosis for that tomato plant. But if it comes out of the wilting stage and you have that early blight on there, go ahead and pick those off, mulching as much as possible um, underneath there so we don't get any soil contact. And if the tomato is large enough, you can actually prune it up six to eight inches above that soil line. So we're not getting that soil to leaf contact. All right, excellent, thanks Amy. All right, all the way from Ogallala, Kelly. Okay. Uh, this is a viewer who has uh, older emerald green arborvita, mm -hmm. but parts of the trees are dying out. They've lost some in the past, haven't had problems. This year they filled in new trees, half of them didn't make it. Is this a disease that came in with the new trees or is this winter injury? What, well, what are we thinking here? Well, I mean, this is pretty common on arborvitae. We see this, these this browning, such as we're seeing, very common. Um, the em emerald green is supposed to be a little more resistant to winter burn, but I have it and I get winter burn. So e initially when I saw the pictures, I was going to suggest maybe looking for some mechanical injury. So with all the heavy snow that we had, if any of these branches were weighted down, did you get some mechanical injury? Um, if you don't see any mechanical injury, then most likely it is a winter burn situation. It's not unusual to have it every single year. They said they planted new ones. If they just planted them this spring and they turned brown, um, that's unusual. Yeah. So um, I guess then you look at, is there anything on the soil or had it been put on the soil recently? But again, this year with all the rain we've had, is that a low area where water drains too with all the raining and you maybe lost the root system and you're getting some browning. So, and I know uh, arborvitae are highly um, susceptible to drought issues and they turn brown, but I don't think that could be an issue this year unless you have a unique situation and you haven't been receiving the rains that we're having. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty common. I think you're gonna continue to expect to see this with emerald green because it just, that's what arborvitae kind of does. So if you don't like it, you may wanna replace it. Otherwise I would prune out the brown, maybe wait a couple of years and see if it'll help fill in. All right. But it'll likely keep doing it. Yeah, exactly, depending on mother nature. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, too much moisture has put a little bit of the brakes on our vegetables and our ornamentals out in the garden, but Terry says hot weather is on the way, and clearly she's right. So let's take a few minutes to see what's happening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're taking a walk and we're kind of checking out our garden. We've had lots of rain all across the state and lots of cloudy weather. So that's really inhibited the growth of a lot of our plants. Usually we're seeing a lot more growth on our pole beans, on our tomatoes and peppers. And with this being cool and cloudy and wet, we're just not really seeing a lot. We're also seeing a lot of chlorotic plants. So we're actually probably gonna have to do a side dressing, a fertilizer on a lot of our uh, vegetables and flowers in the backyard farmer garden. You can see that our tomatoes have barely even reached the second tier of our stands. However, this week in Lincoln at least, we're supposed to have sunny weather and hardly any rain. And it's supposed to start getting hot. So hopefully our plants will um, start producing a little bit better and catch up to what time of year it is. We're also collecting produce out of our gardens. A lot of greens are coming out. We've gotten some beets and we've gotten some um, kohlrabi out of our garden for our, um, our produce from the Hart uh, Gang. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and check out what's growing.
Of, co of course, we'll welcome that rain when we don't get it, which is probably going to start this week, but we are really looking forward to a little bit warmer. 100 is kind of going to knock us on our <laughs> rear ends. All right, so a question from Lincoln for you, Jonathan. Okay. Uh, this viewer has an old rose, Blaze, beautiful climber. Uh, the foliage is getting defoliated and it's skeletonized. Okay. So what, what is that? Well, since we haven't gotten quite into Japanese beetle season yet, I'm gonna say this is rose slug or rose sawfly. Um, it's one of the worst named insects in the world because it looks like a caterpillar. We call it a fly, but it's actually a baby wasp. And so they feed on <laughs> rose leaves and they skeletonize them. They window pane them first. You can kind of see through bits of it. And then they finish it off and really skeletonize it. And I've seen a ton of damage from this this year. We just had like three or four questions about this at the Omaha office today. So it doesn't surprise me that you're seeing it. Picking them off, spinosad, again, would be a good option or a pyrethroid insecticide. But BT, our normal caterpillar go-to, won't work on them because even though they look like a caterpillar, they're not one. And so that's not going to be a good option for you. Try spinosad or maybe a pyrethroid. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, Matt, you have a couple of Tordon questions. All right. uh, the first viewer here is in Verdon or Verdon. And put a drop of Tordon on the cut stumps of mulberry and then okay. right under a pine. And then six months later, the pine is really looking terrible and wonders was that the Tordon. And the second one is actually an Emerson viewer who cut down trees, painted the stumps with Tordon. This is about five years ago. Okay. And is wondering whether they can replant new trees after five years. Um, the first question, painting anything that's under a tree existing, that's basically picloram is active in Tordon. And the way it works is it translocates through the roots and it kills the tree. So if you kill a tree next to a tree, odds are their roots are going to be touching each other. So you don't want to do that because you're going to kill your, the tree that you want. And then the second question would be um, how long do you have to wait? Five years I would think would be plenty unless you're going way off rate with the Tordon <laughs> and you dump a whole jug on it, then maybe it might still be there. But I would guess um, six months to a year's time, you should be able to plant back into those areas. All right, so kind of a bad beast of a chemical. Yeah, I mean, it's, it works well on brush. <laughs> Not on grass though, I mean, usually it's okay on grass. All right, thanks Matt. Okay, this is gonna to come to you, Amy, and we don't know the answer, but this is a viewer in Antelope County that has a bear's lime tree in a container, uh, spent the summer outside. Inside, she noticed some branches are kind of not doing a good thing. Uh, they don't know whether it gets scale. They don't know whether it's a disease. She thinks it might be a canker. So what do, you, what do we think here? So with those type of trees, you know, they go in and out. They're not native to here. And in all reality, seeing a really good picture or depending on the size of your tree, being able to bring it to us to see it or giving us a call. So since you're in Antelope County, I'm over in Holt County. You can always give me a call over in the Holt County office. Um, I'm going back and forth to Norfolk fairly frequently. Or if you're more on that Tilden side, closer to Norfolk, take it into Wayne. He's in the Madison County office. He'd be more than happy to take a look at it too. That's probably going to be one of the best ways that we can get an answer to your question. And even if we don't have an answer, we can take some pictures and send them off to our cohorts in like Florida and where they grow limes <laughs> naturally, so, and get an answer. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, Kelly, this is a Clark's viewer, Clark's, Nebraska, eight Austrian pines, how to care for them relatively quickly. We're almost out of time before the break, but she said the soil is sandy. Okay, well, water, adequate <laughs> watering. And we always, we always warn about overwatering, but it's pretty hard to overwater in a sandy soil. So you'll probably have to water, maybe apply less each time, but you're probably going to have to water more frequently. So just check that soil. I would definitely mulch around those trees. Again, that two to four inch layer of wood chip mulch and a four to six foot diameter ring would be great to just not touching the stem. All right, no, excellent. No nitrogen fertilizer. Perfect, yes. People always want to fertilize when they plant something and yeah, no. six. While you are doing that, we will start the lightning round and Kelly, Lightning round. Lightning round, yes. <laughs> I think last, the last time I was on, I kind of forgot I was in the middle of the lightning round. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a papillion viewer. They uh, planted a Japanese tree lilac last August and it did not bloom this year very well. Is that common? 
Um, somewhat, but it may be that it was just pruned. Um, maybe the nursery pruned it before it came. It should be pruned after it blooms. All right. This is a Lawrence, Nebraska viewer who wants to know whether they can move iris now by digging them and holding them, or do they need to wait? I would wait till August, ideally. All right. This is a Dodge, Nebraska viewer. Planted a two-foot white pine. The leader broke out of it. Will the Will it grow another one by itself or not? Not by itself. You need to take the side one and kind of tip, tip it up and stake it, and it should take over. All right. We have a viewer who said their tomatoes, she think, got hit by herbicide. Uh, if it was herbicide drift, will the tomatoes still be edible? We cannot tell you that they are edible, so we say play it safe and don't right. eat them or make your own decision. So old person's tale is can asparagus beds be salted for the weed control? Asparagus is tolerant of salt, but um, you should not use that because it can damage the structure of the soil. So we do not recommend salt. All right, nice job. That was a little more lightning than last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amy, you ready? Yep. This is a papillion viewer who was told they have black knot on a cherry tree. How do they control that? Pruning it out is your best option. All right, how far below the point of the black knot? Six inches below that black knot is your best choice. All right, this is a Byron viewer. Uh, annuals are dying in containers. They do say the soil has not been changed for years. So I would probably look at a root rod of some sort. We're either dealing with a pythium or a fusarium, depending on if it's wet or dry, depending on it. it you really should change out that soil at least every couple of years because pathogens are going to harbor in there like crazy. All right. This is a viewer who had soft rot in their iris, La Vista. They're wondering, will that affect roses and mums? No, it's very specific to irises only. It should not move on to the others. Um, if you're seeing some issues on your other plants, I'd be looking at a water issue and it being too wet and we need to pull the mulch back and dry things up. All right. Why don't we use Epsom salts for tomatoes? It, it's one of those old people tales. It's not real effective. And with tomatoes, we can't actually get too much salt and we can actually cause some damage to our tomatoes. All right, nice job. You sort of forgot it was lightning. I sort of did. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. normal. You gonna yes. remember, Matt? Yes. All right, this is a Blair viewer. <laughs> this is a Blair viewer. Uh, and they're saying the soil is so saturated it squishes. So any particular turf mowing issues associated with that. Yes. And what would those be? <laughs> <laughs> and what would those be? Uh, you're best staying off of it if it's squishy because you're gonna compact the heck out of it. All right. And if you have to, then you're gonna plan on air refine to relieve some of that this fall. All right, so a follow-up question from that viewer is should they continue to mow on a regular basis? Uh, use your best judgment, but try and do it on the drier days than the wetter days. All right. This is a Nickerson viewer. Two feet of sand were removed. Uh, there is still a bit of a layer. Is there a turf recommendation? Um, I think you'd be fine. You can seed into that. Uh, you're just going to have to probably try and aerify and punch some of that sand in and bring up some soil, and that will help immensely. But the grass should grow through it. It's just keeping it wet. All right. Is there any way to kill broadleaf uh, winter creeper that has crept into the lawn? Yes, with the broadleaf <laughs> herbicide. All right. Is Sundancer buffalo grass available now? Yes. And where? <laughs> Stock seed. <laughs> Stock seed. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. That was good. That, that was <laughs> pretty good. I, I should take <laughs> tips and point, yes, pointers from you, no. Matt. Come on. Are you ready? I, I'm just going to do yeses. <laughs> I'm going to ask you those follow-up questions. He was racking them up. <laughs> I'm going to ask you those follow-up questions. All right, this is, a, a, we think of Valley City. It was a little hard to read. Okay. Um, the carrots have worms and rotted centers. What is that? A root maggot. And how do you control it? Uh, row, floating row covers would be one thing, and crop rotation would be the other. All right, uh, this is a viewer in Lincoln who put down their grub control, but then had two inches of rain. Will it need to be reapplied? It's good to have it watered in, so no, I don't think you'll need to reapply it. All right, and so actually a viewer sent in a question saying, is it time to do grub control? It's a little past time at this point. You can do it right up to about July 4th, but you wanna get it down pretty much post haste. Just get out there and do it. All right, uh, last week we talked about trapping for fruit flies in the house. What is the trap? It can be anything, baby food jar, yogurt cup, anything that will hold the apple cider vinegar in the soap. 
Perfect. All right. Um, can you spray for emerald ash borer? Yes, you can do an injection into the tree, into the soil, or you can treat the tree, the trunk itself. All right. What is a safe control for small grasshoppers on edible crops? Baits. The carbaryl baits for them. All right. What can be used to get rid of aphids on butterfly milkweed? Water. <laughs> you would just blast them with a hose and it would knock them off and they don't get back up on there. And... You win. You win. I did? Yes. <laughs> and this is also this your is last Mjolnir. lightning round because this is your last show. That's true. So you deserve to win. <laughs> Thank you. I allowed it. Yes, Matt let me win. He told me he was going to. Yeah. He gave it he gave it his all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Jonathan. Okay, Kelly, we have great plants of the week and we have one misbehaving. So what do we That's have right. here? Okay, well this is a go big red bouquet is what it is. So the uh, large yellow flower here is Pup art. Um, that's not yellow, that's oh, orange. Orange, <laughs> orange, sorry. I'm, now I'm colorblind. Pup art Asiatic lily. Ah, I'll get it here. <laughs> right here, the great big one. I'm sorry. And our Asiatic lilies are really, really blooming beautifully this year, so that is an especially pretty one. Um, you threw me when you talked about the reverting one. So <laughs> the Iconacea here, the coneflower, that one is hot papaya coneflower. And this is what it's supposed to look like um, with the clusters, the bushy cluster in the center. And this is one over here is the same thing. Let me get it turned around a little bit lower here. And that one is reverting. So you can see it's not quite as bushy in the center. It's losing that. So that's what happens sometimes with hybrids. They start to revert. And then this other one here that looks really weird has aster yellows. Okay. And that's a Phytoplasma? Correct. I always forget. Mm -hmm. So not quite a virus, but related to viruses. And the, unfortunately, the cone flowers tend to do that. Yeah. So. And the treatment for it is? Rogue, rogue it, it out. out. Leave it. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anomaly. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is beautiful in the eyes of the beholder. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted, it's pup art, P-U-P. -P. Pup. Like as a puppy. In, as in puppy, not mm -hmm. pop, although right. it looks like it should be a pop art. Mm -hmm. that, those are all in the backyard farmer garden, by the way, so you can go see Miss Hot Papaya before we <laughs> rogue and pup art. Well, it's still being puppy. <laughs> all right, so speaking of yellow insects, okay. your picture, your next picture is in southwest Omaha. These insects were on some of the milkweed. What are they and how to treat? Those are oleander aphids. They love milkweed. They can get on there, sometimes confuse people. They think they might be monarch eggs, and so they leave them alone, but they can cause some damage to that plant. Blasting them off again with a stream of water, using soap on them, rubbing them off with your finger or glove or alcohol will also work. Anything like that so that you can avoid harming the monarchs that might want to use that plant later. All right, excellent. So your second picture is actually on cilantro. This is east of Lincoln. What is that? That's a soldier beetle, also known as a leather wing. They get their name for their bright colors. Some of them are red, some of them are black, some of them are yellow, kind of like this one. It's a pollinator, and as a larva, it's a predator, and so this one is nothing to worry about. It's a beneficial insect. Excellent. Now we have Roman chamomile. It has taken off, and she's seen these teeny tiny peach-colored mystery critters. Mystery critters, my favorite kind of critters. <laughs> uh, when I zoomed in on this, I'm pretty sure that what we're looking at is a lacewing larva. So lacewings are beneficial insects as larva and as adults. In both stages, they eat aphids and scales and other pests that we don't want to have around. The larval form is sometimes called an aphid gator because their body looks kind of like an alligator, except it has these big metal sh sickle-shaped mouth parts. It looks very rock and roll. And they go up and they attack things and eat them with them. I really advocate for them because they're good. They have, they have a lot of beneficial aspects. I did have a client recently that was bitten by one though, and I found out through some medical literature, it can cause a reaction in human skin. So just don't handle it and everybody will be copacetic. They'll eat your bugs and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jonathan. You have a couple of weed questions and pictures. Uh, your first one, Matt, is weed with yellow flower. We love the golf ball for a sense oh, of yeah. scale spreading through the yard. Tiny little weed, mm -hmm. um, black medic. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, basically, if you had one last year, they produce a lot of seed. It's a little black seed and it'll spread pretty quick. And it generally tends to go in thin areas of the lawn. So there's the issue of having open spots and it's 
not very competitive with turf. So if you have a strong stand, uh, that weed is not going to be a problem. Uh, a lot of the common, let's say, 240 alone doesn't work very good. Uh, you want to get products with a combination of them, Dicamba and MCPP or MCPA, and that works pretty well on those. All right, and pre-merge or no? Um, it's kind of tough to do a pre-merge with that one. Um, it, it doesn't work all the time. It's kind of a bigger seeded, and it, it's a little later in the year or two that it germinates. So some of the pre-mergents we put down for crabgrass are not going to do as well. Uh, Gallery is another one. Uh, Isoxabin, which works really well on those bigger seeded ones, right. broad leaves. And your second picture, of course, is Prost prostrate yeah. and not prostrate weed. Prostrate not weed, a close up. Yeah, in and this uh, northeast Nebraska. Yeah, so. it's everywhere. I mean, in especially in roadways, it's really growing aggressively right now. Uh, thin spots next to the lawns. And that one, if you don't control it now, it's going to seed out. So, along with all those weeds I brought in, you want to try and control them when they're young. As they get older, they're darn near impossible to kill. So uh, same thing with that one. 240 works, but not very well. Combination with dicamba and triclopyr work really well on it. All right, thanks, Matt. Amy, you have about three or four different way cool things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first uh, one is a St. Paul viewer. She's never seen anything like this before in a landscape bed. So what is that one? Well, you need to prepare for the zombie uh, apocalypse because you have <laughs> dead man's fingers coming out of your landscaping bed. The next picture shows it a lot better. Um, these are actually really cool fungus. Um, people get the concept of zombies behind these. <laughs> they're, they're brown and black when they come up and as they start to mature, you actually get this brown discoloration which makes it look like a fingernail. And so that's how it gets its name, Dead Man's Fingers. Very cool. Does it turn Pretty you gross. into a zombie? It might turn you into a zombie. Oh, man. <laughs> Gotta watch out. <laughs> okay, and then our, our own Scott Evans sent us a picture of this one, public playground in Omaha. Beautiful slime mold. Once right. again, a saprophytic breaking down that, that mulch. Very pretty. If you don't like it, uh, a blast of water will get rid of it. All right, and then our third one for you is the first one we've gotten this year. This is a stinkhorn. Uh, if you actually get really close to them, they stink, aka the name. <laughs> if you look at the top, the top of the stinkhorn gets this brown, gooey mess that it's actually attracted by flies. Mm -hmm. And that's how the spores get transmitted around into the landscape. Once again, it is actually a good guy. It's breaking down that mulch and that organic matter. So all three of them are good guys. They're not anything to be really worried about. All right, excellent. Thanks, Amy. This is uh, Norfolk, Kelly. Uh, this tree has been turning brown over the last year. Any idea what is wrong and what to do? It looks like it's a mugo pine, right. a big it's, one probably. It's very uniform browning, um, mm -hmm. so that's why we probably, you aren't giving it to Amy because it, usually <coughs> with uniform browning with diseases, it's more random throughout the tree or more bottom up or inside out. Uh, so I, I think again with the arborvitae, I, it sounds like it's been doing it for a few years, but look closely and check for any kind of mechanical injury or even animal damage or something so like a bowl's been gnawing on in there and causing damage. And it's, it's a large enough area of brown that if you prune it out, you're gonna com cosmetically harm that pine. So you have to make the decision whether you wanna live with the brown or wanna remove the tree. Uh, it possibly could be winter burn as well. All right, thanks Kelly. Well, little knobby spots or bumps on your trees and shrubs might not be the latest rot or spot. Most likely what you have are scale insects, which can be really tough to get rid of. Fortunately, Jonathan and Jody are here to help keep the scales from ruining your woody plants and trees. Jonathan, what are you doing? I thought if we were going to make a video about scale insects, I should pretend to be a scale insect and get into their mindset. Of course you are. <laughs> we have had a high number of scale insect calls That's this true. year. They are such curious, strange, sort of lazy, but damaging creatures. True. So you appear to be a hard armored scale? I am a hard armored scale. I'd much rather be a hard scale with my hard coating here, like an oyster shell scale or a pine needle scale. Or rather than that, than a squishy soft scale that's like an inverted leathery bowl, like a magnolia or calico scale. But why would it be important to know which kind you're dealing with, Jody? Finding out which species of scale you're dealing with will help determine the most effective course of action because with scales, timing is everything. 
scale control is dependent on treating those immature stages known as crawlers. They are small, highly mobile, and they lack that protective armor that you have there, or the wax. So for example, oyster shell scale, they overwinter as eggs and they're protected by their mother, and they hatch in the spring. In comparison, soft scales like magnolia scale, they hatch and they crawl in the late summer or early fall. So what kind of damage do they do to plants? No matter what kind of scale insect you're dealing with, the crawler stage is going to move out from where they were laid and they're going to go to the uninfested portions of the plant and plug their mouth parts in. They've got these little needle-like mouth parts and they start siphoning out that sap for food. They're like little plant vampires. So as they are doing that, they may glue themselves there with some of those soft scales or make that hard coating with the hard scales. Uh, but no matter what they're doing, they're going to cause similar damage. It kind of looks like drought damage. The plant will get wilty and yellowed. It can also create an accumulation of a product we call honeydew. This is the sugary secretion that they excrete out, and it can accumulate on leaves and cars and trunks, and it can attract things like black sooty mold as well. Do you know what else really likes honeydew? Ants and wasps love honeydew produced by sap-sucking insects. So you may see a high number of other insects around your infested trees or plants. A way that you can determine when that crawler stage is, is setting out a tape trap. You can use double-sided sticky tape or electrical tape and wrap that around the branch. Just make sure to come back and check to see when those crawlers are active so then you can think about doing a treatment. What types of treatments are there? When you see those crawlers accumulating on your sticky tape when you have a few of them there, you can use a pyrethroid type product to treat them directly, like permethrin or cyfluthrin. If you wanted to do a systemic control option, you would be using things like dinotefuron or imidacloprid. Those would be applied around the root zone either in the spring or fall, depending on the tree you're trying to protect and what species of scale insect you're dealing with. What about an organic method for our so, organic growers? Yeah, so if you're looking for an organic option, you could use dormant oil in this winter before the buds open or horticultural oil in the spring and summer. And if applied thoroughly to the plant, they are very effective at suppressing different kinds of scale. No matter how you treat for them though, you can't just hide and avoid scales. You have to be out there being vigilant and using those IPM methods. I don't know how we actually even come out of this one other than <laughs> saying that IPM methods are really your best approach always, right? And get sleds, they're fun. Sled. Well, you know, that's actually what I thought you had when we went out there yeah, for those scales. It, it works for small children and large fun adults. <laughs> All right, you have uh, three more interesting ones, Jonathan. The first is, uh, this is the second year in a row that this small sort of thing has been created. He says the bug is green and it flies. What is this? Thanks for the scale again with the keys there. This is a green sweat bee. It has a scientific name, Agapostimnon virusens, and it has kind of a black and yellow abdomen, so it's very two-toned. It's a beneficial pollinating insect and they dig down into the soil and sometimes make these chimneys as we see here. Very cool. It is cool. All right. Uh, your second one is, uh, he just said, here it is. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's an eastern eyed click beetle. It looks kind of cartoonish because on its thorax it has those big eye spots. As an adult, it feeds on pollen and nectar. As a larva, it does attack wood boring insects. And so we would consider this one beneficial as well. If you flip it over on its back and it's alive, it will click in between its thorax and abdomen and jump up in the air. And if you're really crafty, you can play jacks with them. As it jumps up, <laughs> you pick up the jacks and then wait for it to land. Oh, perfect. All right, your final one here is a small brown insect found in his mesclun lettuce. Yeah. This is Omaha. This is a tough one. Uh, from what I can see here, I would say this is probably imported longhorn weevil. I would expect the antenna to be a little longer with that one, so I, I wish I could rotate the picture and get a little different angle on it. But if you send me another photo, I can confirm it. But that abdomen in the back with that bulbous nature, that's what makes me think it's this longhorn <clears throat> weevil. It's not a pest on most plants. It doesn't cause a lot of damage, but it can invade the home in the fall. It's one of our invaders in the fall. So if you put out glue traps and catch them as they come in, that's one option, or a perimeter treatment of a pyrethroid around your house may stop them from being able to get in. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Okay, we have a couple pictures from the same viewer for you, All Matt. Right. And this is, again, a what is this weird, softer looking grass taking over uh, in this particular location? 
Yeah, it is a grass. <laughs> it's not the lightning rod. <laughs> it's, uh, to, from the pictures, it looks like it's creeping bent grass. So I don't know if it's anywhere near a golf course, but that doesn't have to be. It can be contaminated seed that was put there or brought in over time. Um, so yeah, they just start as really small patches and then they just continue to grow year after year. They get a little bit bigger and they do. They look kind of like a little bit lighter green and they're pretty soft bladed, almost like a bluegrass, but not the same. <laughs> uh, so one way you can do to get rid of it would be either to selectively use Roundup and spray the patches, which looks really bad because you have all these yellow spots in your lawn then. Uh, and another way you could do it is either trying to scratch them out, dig them out, and overseed tall fescues, what you look like you had there. Um, and then the third option would be mesotrione, um, and that one works selectively taking creeping bent grass out of, let's say, Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue. Uh, the thing with that is you have to use at least three applications, so it's about every 10 days apart, and it will be white. So there's a couple options there, but that's, that's what you have to do to get rid of it. And probably they should take a sample in to make sure yes. that's what they yes. have before that's, they start. That's even better, because if it's not that, then you, yeah. my advice isn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> the first two still work. Okay. <laughs> All right, Amy, this is a Glenwood, Iowa viewer that has these bizarre broccoli heads. What is going on here? So from the pictures and some investigation I did, it looks like it's brown bead, B-E-A-D. And from North Carolina State University, they say this can be due to a boron deficiency, which for Glenwood, Iowa, I don't know if boron's one of those macro, micronutrients that we'd be deficient in. Um, so you need to take a soil sample to know for sure. But if it isn't a boron issue, North Carolina State states that stated that poor growing conditions. So we've been so overcast and we're not getting the amount of photosynthesis that we should be needing. And yes, broccoli likes it cool, but they don't like it cold either. And so just maybe it's just not been favorable weather conditions for broccoli this year or a lot of our plants this year, really. All right, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. You have a couple of IDs of okay. interesting structures, Kelly. Uh, the first is Council Bluffs okay. and just saw this and she's mm -hmm. wondering what in the world is this mm -hmm. banana-like structure? This is the fruit of Magnolia. So, and it's an aggregate fruit, so it's just basically the flowers made up of, of multiple flowers and they fuse together and so each of those little bumps is kind of the ovary that's developing and it's the seed producing uh, part of the plant. Any fruit is the seed producing part. So, and magnolia does not produce fruit, a lot of fruit, and some years they won't produce it at all. So if you've never seen it before, that's probably why. All right, and your second one is actually, this is an Omaha viewer. 40-year-old uh, linden and, of course, Japanese beetles got it last year or two years ago, and this year hardly touched it so far. <laughs> but they're wondering what these overabundance of two-inch long narrow light green leaves and flowers is. Okay, well, they are the, the flowers and soon to be the fruiting structure. So yeah, it's just been a prolific year for our flowers. A lot of trees, a lot of times it'll get, it'll get warm in March or fe even February, early April, and those flower buds start to swell. And then we get a late spring freeze, so a lot of them <coughs> get damaged. That really didn't happen this year. So we just have a very prolific fruiting year, and I've noticed that the lindens are, are very heavy uh, bloomers right now and uh, great for our bees. There we go. They're Thanks. called the bee tree as well. So. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Well, we have really just one announcement right now. It's kind of a quiet time, and that would be Let's Watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer Sundays on our Facebook page. This week, we are discussing mosquito problems and control with Jody and Jonathan. So be sure to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on the Backyard Farmer or NET's Facebook page this Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Central. And we had kind of a lot of fun with that because you went into that chair a little bit unexpectedly. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so you know what? You get the last question okay. of your last appearance okay. on <laughs> Backyard Farmer, Jonathan. And of course, we all want to wish you, Thank you the best as you depart. And we've already figured out we're going to figure out how to fly you in. Bill's going to come pick me up, right? <laughs> Bill's going to come pick you up whenever we send. Okay. So. Um, this is a viewer who wants to know, is this wolf spider season? Because they seem to have thought they found one that 
looked very dead. It could be. It could be a dead one that you found. They're also maybe waking up. Some of them will overwinter, especially the females, but usually we say it's more of a fall issue. I wanted to say thank you for letting me be a part of a tradition like Backyard Farmer. This is a really awesome show. I hope everybody in Nebraska really appreciates it. And thanks to everybody for being cool and hanging out with me all these times I've been on here. <laughs> and big thanks to Jody Green for being my best friend and Fred and Jim for teaching me how to do this. So thanks everybody. You bet. Thank Excellent. You. We will miss you.